morning, everyone. It's always good to be here, and uh, I'd like to greet each one here, but I'm thinking about the ones on camera as well, those that are listening to it at home or uh, through computer or handheld, or uh, we want to greet them as well, and to know that they're there. Uh, some of them talk with me, some of them say they enjoy what they're doing, and uh, they get in spiritual nourishment that way. Okay, <laughs> keep in touch with us. One says, tell my Oklahoma family hi for me. <laughs> and you probably know who that is. But, uh, that's a blessing, and there's some people that can't get to church that are living near a church, but they can't get there. And so this is a blessing for them, too, to be able to listen to the sermon online this way. Anyway, I've got a, a sermon about prayer today, Nehemiah's prayer. But once I got going on Nehemiah, I kind of spread out a little bit, <laughs> a little more than his prayer. But we have to remember that there are prayers in the scripture, and uh, many people say they don't know how to pray or don't know what to say in prayer. Well, it's a good time to read these kind of prayers and just see how they talk to God and, and God, how God enjoyed their communication, whether they were grumpy or whether they were happy. <laughs> okay. uh, whether they're hurting or in sorrow or grieving or whatever the situation is, God understands and God knows, God hears, God is attentive to our prayers. So. Uh, Sometimes the prayers are difficult ones, and we'll find today that difficult prayers. The children of Israel had been taken captive by Babylon and were away a long time, and uh, they were beginning to be able to go back. And uh, first was Ezra went, went back, and um, 13 years later, uh, Nehemiah went back, I believe it was 13 years after Ezra, that Nehemiah went. I wanted to look up more of the time frame and kind of piece together how long uh, Ezra had been there, and, uh, but it, at least we know it's 13 years after he got there. And you'd have to read Ezra to get some of his uh, input. But I did want to see a little bit of his input because I'm thinking about the conditions that they had in their time. Uh, and what it was like for Ezra to go back and in quite a mixed society that he was in. Uh, you'd think, well, go back and you're in the promised land again, you're back near the temple, you know, you think everything's going to be right, and uh, it wasn't. It wasn't right. He had a lot of praying to do. Ezra was a priest, and so he had an extra job to do, extra concerns that he could do for the people. Some people had gone to Jerusalem and seen the conditions, helped with the conditions there, whatever, and then gone back to uh, Babylon to report, to encourage other people to come back, I guess. But also, uh, uh, they had ended up in Shushan, which was the, the uh, uh, seasonal, if I can get the right word here, uh, summer, or was it winter? Summer. summer. No, it was winter. Winter residence of the king. <laughs> it was a winter residence of the king. I know when I was looking up Jushan on the map and trying to figure out where they were. In the, oh, they're down by the mouth of the river near the uh, uh, the Persian Gulf. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, it must be pretty mild. You know, as you're down close to the water, you'd have the warm air from the water uh, to kind of help control the overall temperature. If you're Further up the river, you could get winds from down, you know, coming down the river, from cold to warm, and vice versa. And so you could get quite a bit of cold air coming down that river canyon, and uh, moderate your temperature in maybe the wrong direction. <laughs> Summertime, the cool would be fine, but uh, this was the winter residence for the king. And uh, they'd come there and were talking with Nehemiah. He was asking them how things were going in Jerusalem. And they could report to him. So, uh, the conditions. We're going to be in Nehemiah. So I want you to turn to Nehemiah. Of course, Ezra is right next door. So we're going to be looking back a little bit into Ezra. I'm going to make sure I don't 
make all of the sermon in Ezra, which would, would have been real easy to do. I put a lot of red, a lot of greens this time in Ezra, and uh, got to make sure that I come back to uh, Nehemiah. Anyway, uh, if you go with me too to Ezra chapter nine, I don't think I want to go any further back. I did look some back uh, further, but in Ezra nine, uh, the temple had been built, and they were trying to get things done right and trying to set up things right, and uh, they had a problem. They had sin, lots of sin. And so you start off in chapter 9 with telling about eight different countries that were represented there. They all came with their gods, they all came with their cultural problems, their situations, they're trying to get along with each other. And the people that were involved was everybody, the standard people, the priests, the Levites, and, and so on, everybody was involved. And in verse, uh, uh, halfway through verse 1, it's a long verse, uh, they were into abominations. All of those people were doing abominations of these various eight countries. Canaanites was an awful situation. Remember I've told you before that they were the ones that used to kill their first child and bury it in the walls of their house so their house would have a, a blessing on it. Awful situation. God was just so upset with things like that. God loves children. Loves the little ones. And uh, so there's all kinds of abominations. If you're trying to look up each one of these and find out what they had, I don't think we'd want to know. <laughs> and I don't think we need to know. Because that just is disturbing. And we sure don't want to learn their ways. That would be even worse. But one thing they had done as well in verse 2 was that they had intermarried. Uh, the standard folks, there was some leeway for intermarriage. Uh, especially if they were coming into the Hebrew faith and if they could go into the temple or not, you know, different, different rules until so many generations had gone by and they could kind of marry and the people took on the faith. But the priesthood was not allowed to marry outside the faith. That was for sure. Otherwise, you could have somebody completely from a different country being in the priesthood. And you had to have the Israelites, you had to have the the Levite tribe, and then you had to have Moses' tribe kind of thing, his family, uh, at Moses. Uh, I'm thinking of Aaron. Aaron's tribe, in order to be in the priesthood. Well, he didn't really have a tribe. He was part of the Levites, right? He was a branch of the Levites. But you had to be of Aaron's family line in order to be in the priesthood. The Levites had their own jobs at church and the way they did things and what had to be done for, for serving church. But the Levites also and the people from Aaron's family line had married outside the faith. So that's what's in the uh, in chapter, in verse 2 of this chapter 9. Along with the, uh, the prince, princesses and the rulers and the, everybody had transgressed this law. And uh, uh, it's so distressing to them. I, I want to go to, uh, uh, since I just mentioned that, let's see, in, uh, well, it's going to be further down, I guess, in the book of Acts. I think. I better leave that one for the moment. Yeah, don't see it at all. But uh, I wrote it in very tiny. First <laughs> uh, Corinthians, Second Corinthians. Yeah, Second Corinthians. There we go. I, I will look at it now since I mentioned this about the marriage situation. We see it in the Old Testament. And you say, well, that was just the the. Uh, the Levites and so on. But what about God's thing in the New Testament in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
that is a big thing. We always heard about this Pearl's home church when she was young, my home church when I was young. Mary in the faith. Mary in the Lord. Those, those words are actually there to Mary in the Lord um, in, in another place. Uh, talking about widows and, and so on. To Mary in the Lord. So um, here you find it right here in verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. They hadn't become faithful. They hadn't become believers. And if we marry into that situation, it's going to make more trouble than, than good. Uh, have them accept the Lord first, if it's going to be something that you want to consider. And make sure that it's for real. Okay, another after unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? So why are you with that group? Why did you find that person? How did you find that person? Probably wasn't a good situation. And what communion hath light with darkness? Definite dividing. Not, not going there. Just uh, Mary in the Lord. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? That even sounds worse, doesn't it? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. It is so important to make a difference when young people are looking for husband and wives, or later in life something happens with your partner and you're looking for a spouse. Uh, it's, it really has got to be through the spiritual side of life, looking in the right places, being in the right places. Youth camps, conferences, you know, uh, various places that are good places to be. And it's kind of a shame sometimes, or kind of strange, when we have a visitor come to church and they're actually looking for a wife. But that's a good cause, right? <laughs> that's a good cause. Uh, we, we should not belittle that. It's, uh, they went to the right place, okay? And uh, we hope them, uh, well, pray for them uh, that they have good luck in that department. Uh, but we need to be careful for ourselves that we don't have this situation that they had here in Ezra chapter 9. Uh, people were in terrible situations. So the priest was really upset, spiritually. Spiritually really upset at what was happening. And he wanted to be so close to God. Listen to it in verse 3. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment his clothing and my mantle even his covering coat and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished now that's pretty bad we say oh somebody's you know really worried or really upset and start pulling their hair out uh, this was on purpose because he was so sad so overwhelmed with sin and with the problem that it created now what do you do? You know, you've got this major problem. Now what do you do? Because you've got children involved, you've got husband and wives, and, and uh, they're, uh, you know, what are they going to, if they separate, what, what do you got? You've got another problem. Okay? So uh, it's, it's something that you've got to not do to start with. Anyway, uh, he was so upset, so astonished, is a way of saying just beside himself, just all disturbed as to what to do next. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of God of, of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. The others began to shake because what is the priest going to have to do now? He has to come up with a, with a statement. Come up with a policy, as we would say. Now what's going to happen? What is God going to say about this whole thing? When he hears from God, what's going to be the statement from God about their situation? So verse 5, And at the evening sacrifice I arose 
from my heaviness, and, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, to the Yahweh, the YHVH, my God. He got on his knees. Sometimes we don't do that often enough, I guess. But he got down on his hands and knees and he spread out his hands, asking, give me the input. Sometimes they put their hands on the ground to support themselves, they bend way over. Sometimes they just knelt there with their hands spread out. And this sounds like spread out would be more like out in front of him. So he was serious with God is the information here that I'm seeing, very serious with God because of the problem, the major problem that was before the, the believers. Go to chapter 10, verse 1. And when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, the assembly uh, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. Everybody began to really understand how serious the situation is. They were crying over, now what are we going to do? Are our children going to be taken from us? Are our parents going to be taken from us? Um, the households that have to be split, what, what is going on here? And they were praying diligently. Now, verse 3, oh, and actually verse uh, 2 as well, they, uh, we have transgressed against our God. So this intermarriage, this problem that they had, the following with the teachings of those nations, it was all against God. In verse 3, Now therefore let us make an, a covenant with our God to put away all the wives such as, and such as were born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. They already had the law. They already knew better, and they'd broken the rules. Now they realize they have to go back to the law, go back to doing it right, and they tremble at the law of God. Do we tremble sometimes? We should think about it, how serious God's laws are, and the consequences of breaking God's laws. And say, I don't want to do that, I don't want to get in trouble. So they go back and should do that. Uh, I've got some markings down in verse 6. Uh, the main thing there was transgression. Transgression. I look for some of those words sometimes that they had transgressed and they needed to confess it. Further down the, um, is that the next chapter? No, the same chapter, just long verses. Um, he gave them three days in verses 8 and 9 to come together. And they, in the end of verse 9, they were trembling because of this matter. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the transgress and the trespass of Israel. You know, you had all of these other problems already that you need to be confessing and praying for. Oh, they were transgressions. And then you've done this on top of it. That's what I get from that. So he wanted them to confess. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers. And so it done through there. Make the confession. We don't ever want to forget that. That when we come to a problem situation, we need to confess it. Don't try to hide it from God. He already knows. And he won't be surprised neither. He already knows everything. If we need to confess. Just fess up, as some say. <laughs> you did wrong, just fess up. And tell God. Uh, and otherwise, down in the end of verse 14, otherwise what's going to happen is you'll have the fiery wrath of our God that could be turned on to you. Could be in a lot worse trouble. So then we go to Nehemiah, which like 13 years is in here. After the, uh, before he went, when he was able to get there, and Nehemiah had already built the 
the church, but now the wall needed to be kept. But you, you get another essence in here. When you start reading the book of Nehemiah, you realize that they had left everything as a garbage heap and had just fixed the church. Well, that's not exactly right neither, is it? They needed to clean up the city. Why were the gates still burnt after all these years? 70 years? Why didn't somebody clean it up? That's, that's what I'm seeing. There's timbers laying in different directions. One place he said he couldn't get his animal to go through because it wasn't, you know, get the animal hurt or stepping over things and said he couldn't get his animal to go through. Uh, interesting reading. Why did they leave it this way? They needed to pick up and clean up that city. Even if the walls weren't being built or couldn't be built because of all the complainers against them. But here in Nehemiah, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, uh, Nehemiah is asking those that were come back to him from Jerusalem. And he says, uh, the people that are there, the Israelites that escaped, or the Jews that escaped, from being captured and taken into Babylon, and they reassembled back there. Uh, how's it going with those guys? Some were allowed to go back home with Ezra. How's it going with them? He's just asking about how their spiritual life is and so on. And his answer that he got was that it was a great affliction and reproach that the wall of Jerusalem was not built there in, in verse uh, 3. The wall wasn't built yet. So he begins to pray about that. What, what does he do in verse 4? And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, not, not just an hour, half an hour, an hour, two hours. Days went by, certain days. And fasted. How many days? How many meals did he miss? And he fasted and prayed before God, the God of heaven. In verse 5, And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, great and terrible God. He's understanding how powerful God is and how involved God is. That keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Ah, oh, he's putting some conditions in here. He said, I know all about you, and I know that you bless people, you keep covenants with people that serve you, that love you, that observe your commandments. You keep the covenants with them, you keep mercy with them. I'll just take a quick peek at my notes here again, so I don't get too far away from them. Um, so they had a lot of affliction there, the walls not being down, the gates burnt, they... Uh, uh, it brought me right away to thinking about our churches nowadays. Almost any brand name, any denomination that you want to name, they're having problems. Most people are getting delinquent in going to church. People are not living up to the standards of the building that they go to. They think it's all just nothing. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't keep a standard. Don't have any particular standard. Or my standard is as good as yours and so on. So we've got a similar situation is what I'm thinking. And I, and I right away started thinking, what about the last days? And I started getting into the scriptures quickly, to see what I could find out, whether we're worse or better. Um, 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Turn with me to 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Just hold your finger in the other place there. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. We're in the last days, we're pretty sure about that after all the time that has, has passed. So when it says, this know also in the last days perilous times shall come. We can believe it, we can see it, we know it. In fact, I was listening to a TV program in the middle of the night that I caught just a few minutes of, but in 67 when all the people took a run on San Francisco, it was going to be everything free. We're going to make a new society of all the people under 25. And they made a tre tremendous run. And they had the, the city leaders uh, being interviewed on television. And they said the infrastructure is going to fail. You know, the sewer system, the water system. You, know, you, you go down the list. It's going to fail because nobody is paying for anything. They're just using it. 
Everything for free. Yeah. It's going to be ruined. And we, and we have this time. We have this perilous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, head, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. People have their own rules to their own game and my rules are as good as your rules and I can do my own thing. And nothing's ever wrong with it. That's the kind of world, right? Not brand new, but it's gotten worse from all these years, from 67 the 70s were the same idea, the 80s the same, the 90s, all just a little different twist. I can remember, and I talked about Pearl just recently too, about a fellow that was in, in accounting in Canadian Pacific Airlines, and he gave it up when Pearl and I were just getting married. Uh, he gave it up and wanted to just live in a group housing. They ended up on a boat tied to the government wharf. You know, everything's free for them, right? They got a leftover ship, I guess, boat, and uh, the wharf was paid for by the city. Yeah, sure, who pays for it then? The sewer system, the bathrooms, and, oh, who's paying for this? Well, it's all free for that, you know. Everything's free, and that's where he was living, with about seven or eight others on that same boat as a place to sleep, I guess. I can't believe it. He was in accounting. He was doing quite well. He was a guy with a suit and everything. I thought he was doing pretty good. What a world we've got. What a messed up logic that is going on. They don't know God and they're not willing to live by it. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is in Timothy's time, not our time. But yeah, They're talking about our time, aren't they? And things have just gone on downhill until we got here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, no, something's caught me here. Chapter 4, oh, 1 and 2, I'm sorry, it's not 12, it's 1 and 2. <laughs> 1 and 2. Uh, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil, devils. People have defected from the true teachings. And that was here in this time. The, even 300, 100, 200, 300 years after Christ, this was already happening. They were defecting from the truth. They were setting up their own religions with the doctrines of devils and seducing spirits, and then teaching that stuff so that people would worship evil, false gods, false ideas, false traditions, uh, leftovers from heathen worship. They're making it as a Christian worship. They're speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron so they can't feel anymore. Um, forbidding to marry, and so on. You can read some of the other things that, that are in here. But that's the kind of life that is going on now as well. So I, I caught one more here, particular, particularly 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Chapter 2, and it begins about verse 9. Uh, there's more above it, but I wanted to catch a few things here. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They don't want the love of the truth. They want to go the other way, do their own thing. Verse 11, And for this cause God sent them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They philosophize until the lies don't mean anything anymore. They say, well, that's all right. It won't matter. God forgives everybody. You know, it's, 
but they're wrong. That they might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. We, we could go on. It's, you know, but that's the kind of world that we're in. And the offshoots of those. So when we are back here with, with, uh, with Nehemiah, uh, these conditions were just an awful situation and he went to pray. He knew he was going to be needing to go there and pray. So uh, I, I right away came to mind, if you see the conditions that prevail and you want to do something about it, pray, but there's, there's another one. Do you remember in Revelations chapter one, and, uh, two and three, chapter two and three, the seven churches? Almost every one, he says, I got something against you. The one he said, you got that Jezebel, you know, and he goes down, down the list. She claims she's a prophet, but she's not, you know, and so on, and he gives some things. And uh, then he says, uh, repent. These are letters and sermons to those churches that were there, and almost every one of them it says repent, because he had something against them, that they, they were doing good over in this and this, and good in this and this, but he had something against them. The last one we always figure is our time frame, if we give some kind of errors on this, but I think we fall into a lot looking like the Laodiceans more than anything else. We're neither hot nor cold. You do as you please. You don't have to be there. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. There should be no rules for the game. We're neither hot nor cold. And God said, I'm going to speed you up. You can't take it. He wants them to be one way or the other. So repenting and knowing what you're repenting of and to get uh, guidance for that. And one, one verse here, this was the Acts 20 that I thought I needed, but this is the one. Acts chapter 20. Verse 29 and 30. 29 and 30. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, and drawing away disciples after them. This happened at his time, when he died, or after his era was passed, when he could no longer go out to these churches. After his departing, whether he was leaving this area of the country, or whether it was actually the end of his life, but he says, after my time, this is what's going to happen that grievous wolves will come in because they eat lambs. The younger the people in the faith, the more delicate taste they have for these wolves that come in. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They pretend to be Christian, pretend to be believers, but they're actually there to eat up the young. And the full-size sheep as well, if they're not careful. And then he said, uh, of your own selves. There'll be a division amongst people, and one will say, well, I know better than anybody else, so you guys all follow me and I'll teach you the right way. I know this part of the Bible. I've studied that part of this. I've studied that part of that. I know Hebrew, or I know Greek, or I know the Hebrew systems, or uh, whatever. Um, and they'll get people to follow them, and it's actually nothing more than philosophies, which is another one that Paul warned Timothy and Titus about philosophies that people would have, and they're drawing people after them and will try to destroy. Anyway, back in Nehemiah, we were down to uh, verse 4, 4, 5, 6, we got down in there. Uh, when it says certain days, he was serious about it. He didn't just do an afternoon or an hour. He got serious about the certain days in verse 4 that he was earnestly talking to, the, talking to his Heavenly Father. And you know in verse 5 you can actually see that he knew God. He knew he kept covenants. He knew he had mercy. He would take care of people that observed his commandments and that loved him. God would take care of them. So he had a relationship with the Heavenly Father. 
He persevered in prayer in verse 6. He went on and on, just saying day and night he was praying. And he prayed for the people as well as himself. Uh, in the uh, middle of the verse, he says, Thy servant, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant himself. He's praying for himself. But he knows that God knows him. And he's not arrogant about saying, I'm your servant. Because it was a fact. God knows whether it's right or wrong. He said, I am your servant, and I know that you hear me. That's the relationship. And he's praying before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants. He says, I'm going back, God, and I'm going to hold you accountable. Remember, you said that if the children of Israel did so and so, you'd be with them. They were going to be them. They would be his people. He would be their God. And he said, if they would confess their sins, the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, he wants to tell God that we, him and those other folks, have sinned, and he wants God to help get, out, get them out of it. And then there's a colon, and it says, both I and my father's house have sinned. He's not saying, let me off easy. You know, <laughs> sometimes we want to say, uh, that, that we uh, have made a mistake, or <laughs> we try to make it kind of light, don't we? Uh, it might say, uh, if we have sinned. He didn't do that. He just said, we have sinned. Just get straight on with God and, and uh, talk with him plain. And in verse 7, uh, we're going to hear more about God's promises and uh, how he's going to say to God, uh, I know that you, what you said, you do what you would do, Lord. He said, you said you're going to do it, and I know you're going to do it. Okay. So here in verse 7 and 8, we have uh, dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commanded thy servant Moses. So now he's, he's saying all of these things, that you know, we've dealt corruptly with you. We haven't kept our side of the bargain. And yet you've given these commandments to Moses for us, for our good. And then he's saying uh, statutes and judgments and commandments. There's extra things. The Ten Commandments, but there's more. There's standards or there's policies, you might say. There's other things that are put here. Statutes that you'd live by. Judgments that you ought to live by. How you make decisions and so on. Uh, God gave all of those things for us to live by. Remember, I beseech you, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Okay? And he's, this, is, this is a rule. If you do this, this is going to happen to you. And they have been scattered, right? So he's not telling God something that God didn't know. He's just saying, you said this, and it happened. Verse 9. But here's another thing God said. But if ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, or the whole side of the earth, the opposite side of the earth, the whole thing that's under heaven, even though you're out there, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. He's telling God, this is what you said. Some of us are here now. We want you to keep this promise to us. And God will. He'll keep that promise. If they turn back to God and keep his commandments. They have to return to the faith. Return to the true way of living under the Heavenly Father's power and, and ruling. Um, now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed from thy great power and by thy strong hand. So these, these people that are standing here are the ones that you brought back, the ones that are really your people. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant himself, and to the prayers of thy servants, all these other people that are here, who desire to fear thy name. These people are here because they want to be here, because they want to serve you, because
because they want to fear your name. They want to do right by you, Heavenly Father. And I want you to, to know that they're here for that reason. Desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I for I was the king's cupbearer. Kind of ends strangely there, but he's trying to put you into an order of the next chapter. So the people that are going to be there or are already at Jerusalem, he's praying for them before he gets there. And he said, they're already there. And even if we look towards Jerusalem, we pray towards Jerusalem, God, you said you'd, you'd hear us. And some are already there, and he's wanting to go. That's what's happening. He's wanting to go. He's willing to go. The next chapter, he goes to take the drink to the king. Now, the kings would never drink out of a vessel, a bottle or otherwise, until a certain person had tasted it, because if, if it was a slave and, and the and there was poison in that bottle and they fell over dead, well then the king didn't die. So they had a person that would do the drinking, a person that would taste their food and so on, so that the king wouldn't be put to death by some trickery or poison. So he had to go and, and uh, give the wine, the drink, uh, to the king. And the king noticed that he was sad. He said he hadn't done that before, you're not supposed to do that. He said he hadn't tried that before, but he was sad and the king could tell it. And the king says, are you sick? And he had to admit, no, I'm sorrow. The king, the king actually said that too. But it's sorrow of heart. So, so what's, what's your sorrow? He wants to know. And when he tells the king, he's afraid. He was sore afraid at the end of verse 2. Because now he was talking to the king, which could just like it or dislike it. He could kill him. He could do anything he wanted. But he was afraid. And he was praying. Lord, help me. I'll bet you that was his thing going through his mind before he started speaking. But he told him about the city. He told him about the sepulchers that laid waste. And uh, the city was burned with fire and it's a mess. And he just really wanted to go. Then the king, says, king said unto me, verse 4, For thou hast, thou dost thou, what dost thou make? request. Okay, what are you going to ask for? What do you want? So I prayed to the God of heaven. That's where I thought, yeah, silently but diligently. And uh, he told the king what he needed, what he would like to do, and uh, he said, send me and I'll straighten things out over there. And the king uh, was glad for that and said, you can go. He provided a whole bunch of things for him so that he could build, fix up the city. And it's neat that they put the little bracket in there, the queen was sitting by him also. Isn't that something? That the queen was there and she heard all this as well and was uh, able to uh, hear what was going to happen in the kingdom. So the last part of verse 6, so it pleased the king to send me and I set a time for him. He needed to say when he was going, how long he'd be away, when he expected to be back, and what he was going to do at the other end, what kind of things he would need, and he asked for a letter, that the king would give him a letter so that he would be able to say, I'm on a mission with the king's approval. And he's coming through there and going to be doing these things. Very interesting story. I couldn't stop there. I just kept reading. <laughs> okay. But I want to wrap this up. Here am I, send me. We've heard that before in the scriptures, right? But here he's saying it also. He was willing to go so that God could use him wherever possible. So if we look back through the time frame that's there that I talked about, how awful the situation was there even before he arrived, 13 years before he arrived. And then he was able to go and try to fix up. The church was supposed to be functioning. He'd probably have to tell him, get on with it. Okay. <laughs> but, but the church was supposed to be functioning. His job was to build the walls and to build the gates to the city and so on. Interesting where he took the horse and, or took an animal and went out and viewed the stuff with nobody else watching him at night. So he was able to go and see what was going on there. Uh, but it was a bad situation. But what he did first off, when he heard about it, he got serious with God. We need to do that. Get serious with God. Confess. God already knows. Might as well confess. 
might as well tell him what, what's happening in your life, what's not happening, what you would like to have better, and the people that are there, that they've sinned, there's a messy situation there, and he's going to hold God to the promises. He said, if we pray this direction, you'll hear our prayers, you'll we'll answer. And he desired to consecrate himself and the others in the desire of the fear of the Lord. So we need to go for having our prayers answered by prayer, seriousness with God, fasting, kneeling, uh, getting right with the Lord, and just really turning it over to God. But one last thing, include ourselves in what we'll do for the Lord. I'll go, send me, I'll work for you, Lord. Thanks. Amen.